Okay. All right, folks. So we are into our next unit uh, on uh, Chicanx and Latinx individuals or communities in the United States. Um, this is going to be a very broad overview, and it's going to encompass a lot of time, um, like with African Americans in the United States. So um, bear with me on a lot of the historical facts. Uh, a lot of this is meant to give uh, broader social context and history towards this community, um, which will also help us understand the current issues that they face. And that's where we're going to round off with, like how we did with the discussion on Black Lives Matter and African Americans in the United States. So um, let's get into the material and then we can kind of discuss this further. So um, what we're going to cover today is what is uh, Chicanx and Latinx. And that term has evolved historically. And we'll probably actually ponder this question over the next couple of um, lectures, just so that way we can kind of flesh out or um, unearth what these terms actually mean. Um, because uh, Chicanx and Latinx individuals did not consider themselves as such. And there's been a lot of different um, historical precedents that have um, caused individuals to think about themselves in that way. Um, we're going to cover a lot on um, early American history, um, particularly with Mesoamerica and indigene sorry, indigeneity, Spanish colonial role and race, um, what that uh, European conquest did to our understandings of race within this community and then across kind of uh, Latin America. Um, this emergence of this idea of mestizo and what that actually means, and that's very complicated in of itself. Latin American independence and the new Latin America. Uh, Latin American independence is a little bit after um, American independence, and its independence is um, distinct in a lot of ways. So we want to discuss what that means, um, both because of its uh, newness and its difference or distinctness. Uh, we want to be clear that uh, we understand that in relationship to the United States, um, we want to think about US, the U.S.'s involvement in Latin America in two key wars, um, the Spanish-American War and the U.S.-Mexico War, what that means for the Southwest and Mexican-Americans, and then um, early trends in migration and racialization for these communities in the 20th century. Okay, There are three key terms that we'll be focusing on today. One is going to be uh, mestizo and mestizaje, um, which is considered to be the largest cultural mixing in the world, which took place in Latin America. This idea of self-determination, and this comes out of um, the independence movements in Latin America, and self-determination is just a belief and or right of people to freely determine their political, social, and economic development. Um, that's very key, especially today as we're having conversations about um, American or Western involvement in other countries. We can think about this with regard to Afghanistan um, and the withdrawal of individuals and now the, the Taliban and, and other, um, you know, political, regardless of their um, uh, uh, kind of cultural and or um, uh, legal frameworks, what it actually means to determine what you want for your country um, and how that actually meshes with other countries and and what this is going to be important for, especially when we get into Harvest of Empire and we look at neocolonialism, is um, does these large Western powers like Europe, America, so on and so forth, um, enable or and or allow um, countries that are seeking independence to actually be to uh, have them or allow them to uh, determine themselves or have the sense of self determination outside of um, what other foreign powers want. And then lastly, we're gonna look at push and pull migration. Um, this is very important because um, I think migration is talked about in a very um, superficial sense. And what I mean by that is we just think of migration as this process of people moving. And rather um, what scholars have noted um, in ethnic city sociology, anthropology, um, and a variety of other um, academic fields is that there are a lot of factors that drive people to move from country to country. And I wanna be very clear and I wanna be very um, deliberate in talking about migration, uh, especially um, from country to country, that this is not a, um, a simple process. Um, a lot of people I think uh, believe that migration just happens uh, because, and yes, human beings have moved 
all over the world uh, for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, but uh, especially today, uh, given the um, the heavy ties to our national origin, so America, Mexico, Cuba, um, you know, countries in Africa, countries in Asia, so on and so forth, uh, it's not as easy to move um, because our identity as human beings is very much tied to that nation that we live in. Um, secondly, it, it takes a lot of capital and infrastructure, right? It takes a lot of money to move um, and start over somewhere else. Uh, countries don't necessarily have programs in place to integrate individuals and nor do they provide resources and supports for migrants. So given that, uh, we want to be very clear that there are factors that push people out of their country, right? Which can be like war, economic strife, gangs like we have seen in Central America, um, shifts in political regimes as we've seen in the Middle East. Um, and then there are pull factors, right? Does the country itself actually want those folks, right? So are there programs in place or is there job opportunities in place, so on and so forth that will um, uh, encourage migration to certain locations, right? Because um, for example, Mexicans uh, could travel south um, for better economic opportunities, but because Central America and South America aren't necessarily uh, or don't necessarily have the same economic opportunities as America, it makes much more sense for um, Mexicans to travel north, right? And there are also historic patterns in place for this, right? The same reason why there are a lot of folks from the continent of Africa that travel to Europe versus America, right? It's much closer. There may be economic opportunities for them. Um, there may be historical patterns in place, so on and so forth, right? So we always want to keep that in context when we're thinking about uh, migration in the U.S. Okay, so what is Chicanx and Latinx? Uh, this group encompasses one of the largest ethnic groups in the US, okay? So um, we are on pace, or Chicanos and Latinos are on pace to out um, match any other ethnic group in the US. And we have been seeing what is called the browning of states, okay? So the browning of states means that in California, for example, and I believe soon in Texas and other locations, we are going to see more folks who identify as, you know, Chicano, Latino, Hispanic, Chicanx, Latinx, whatever that terminology is um, in those countries. Uh, California right now, I believe is about 39% Latino uh, or Latinx, Chicanx identified, um, which is out past or out, uh, outpaced or outpast the uh, existing white population, which is a, roughly about 38%, um, right? Um, this is an ethnicity, okay? And we wanna make sure that we're always clear that this is an ethnic group, not a race group, right? So remember that race is based on colorism and colorism has two, or has that kind of original framework of uh, white, yellow, black, and um, red. Uh, brown came in a little bit later to encompass Malays. Uh, but we, what we understand as brown people today comes from whites and indigenous or native Americans, right? So whites were here, because of Spanish colonization, like with European colonization or British colonization in, in the United States and French colonization in Canada. And then obviously indigenous communities had lived here for hundreds of thousands of years beforehand. And if you remember back to our conversation about race and racialization, um, it, part of the reason why um, it was very difficult to enslave and colonize um, indigenous peoples because they had lived here for almost 200,000 years uh, prior to conquest. Um, this ethnicity also encompasses the widest range of languages, religions, and cultural practices of any other minority group. And this is also very important to think about, okay? There are a lot of Hispanics in the United States who do not speak Spanish, or there's a lot of Chicanx and Latinx people who do not speak Spanish. They also speak a hybrid language called Spanglish. There are folks who speak various forms of Spanish, right? So there's Caribbean Spanish, there's Mexican Spanish, there's Central American Spanish, there's South American Spanish, right? And there's also Cotillion Spaniard Spanish, okay? Those are all different dialectical forms. With that, there are a dozen different indigenous dialects that are throughout all of Latin America. Some are like Nahuatl, right? Um, or, uh, uh, I'm gonna forget the one from the Incans. But anyways, there are a lot of different uh, presence there. Many um, Latinos consider themselves to be Catholic and there's a lot of influence from the Catholic church due to colonization. However, we have seen expansions with that in terms of a growing presence of Mormons um, and other um, Christian subsets, 
um, there's a lot of heavy influence from indigeneity. Um, you guys will be uh, coming up on a very um, historic holiday uh, called Dia de los Muertos. Dia de los Muertos actually has indigenous roots. The part of the way that um, Spanish colonizers got indigenous people to buy into um, being uh, Christianized was for allowing them to celebrate their cultural holidays. Dia de los Muertos um, is actually a um, indigenous holiday that was recognized by the Spanish church and, or the Catholic church and uh, was um, celebrated alongside other holidays like uh, Christmas, so on and so forth. Dia de los Muertos is not celebrated in Spain or in the Caribbean. It is indicatively of the continental Western hemisphere. Um, and it, it has a lot of nuances, whether it's in Mexico, Central America or South America. Part of the reason why it's very important for indigenous people, and I'm only gonna talk about this briefly here, this isn't a part of the larger lecture, but part of the reason why it's important for indigenous people is because indigenous people did not believe in death the same way that Christians do. Um, a lot of indigenous people believe in a more um, complex life after death. If you've seen Coco, for example, the movie that was popularized a couple of years ago, um, the uh, land of the dead, as mentioned in the film, is this kind of afterlife with a complex society. Um, and so many non-Western um, uh, belief structures and religions do not treat death as an ultimate ending, rather just a transformation of life, right? And so again, uh, within that context of religion, there's a lot of differences there. And in terms of cultural practices, it's the same, right? So there are a lot of diversity in terms of what you celebrate, what you eat, how you eat, so on and so forth. Some communities eat tortillas, some eat bolillos, some eat um, mostly pork, some eat mostly uh, beef, some uh, are inherently uh, vegetarian, and actually there's a lot of uh, historical work trying to show that many of the indigenous societies in um, Latin America were actually inherently vegetarian, relying mostly on what were called the three sisters, squash, beans, and corn. Um, and so again, multitude of diversity in this, in this um, community, but not really um, comported within the normal structures of an ethnicity and race in, given that diversity. And it's constantly evolving. We are seeing much more biraciality and multiraciality in there. There are a lot of um, interracial marriages going on. We're seeing um, uh, these uh, new emergences of um, uh, African-American and, and Latino communities there are already existing Afro-Latino communities or Asian Latino communities. There are a lot of folks that are trying to reclaim their indigeneity. Um, so on and so forth. And so because of that diversity, it's very important to recognize that. And so as we go back in history, which we're going to do in this lecture specifically, we're going to unpack some of that. And then that's going to help us think about what has been the historic mistreatment of this community along this, um, this diversity of uh, ethnicity, which has really kept them out of what we now know as um, historic or political or legal whiteness. And remember that legal whiteness um, is one of the easiest ways to be a, considered a citizen. Go back to the thin Ozawa um, legal case. In this um, situation, right, um, because uh, this diversity and, and frankly, it's it's kind of um, mixing or, or Latinos mixing with um, you know other groups. It's it's kept them largely out of whiteness. So um, Mesoamerica is a gigantic territorial and cultural area. Um, what I provided you here on the right is some uh, examples of this in terms of the types of indigenous communities and what they were there or what was, what was happening in different locations. Um, but like with what we would become the US, there was a huge amount or huge amounts of indigenous tribal groups throughout Latin America. There were four major ones, the Aztecs, Mayas, Olmecs, and Incans. Um, uh, but these four groups, distinct in, in some ways, were actually very um, similar, okay? So they had um, philosophical systems, writing systems, um, they had science, they had mathematics, um, many of them had universities, um, they had huge uh, architecture, art, so on and so forth. And so these were very, very established societies and civilizations, again, being in existence for well over, you know, um, uh, several thousand years, right? 
uh, again, you know, kind of vast in terms of their um, cultural traits, right? Uh, many of them have aqueducts and trade routes. Um, you'll read a chapter of this a little bit later in the course by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. Um, but in her book, Indigenous Peoples, History of the United States, she notes that there were um, these complex trade routes from uh, parts of Latin America into North America where they were finding tropical bird feathers um, in native headdresses in Alaska that were coming from parts of Central America. Um, sadly though, huge swaths of indigenous populations were killed off largely because of Columbus and um, the ensuing colonization that happened shortly afterwards. Uh, I provide here a, a uh, graph showing native decline from the University of Wisconsin, showing that there was about 125 million indigenous people here um, in the, uh, you know, in um, the continental Americas, and that declined to about 3 million. Um, if you ever want to watch something very comical, uh, um, John Liguazamo, who is a very famous Colombian and Puerto Rican um, com uh, comedian and actor did a special for Netflix called um, uh, Latino History for Morons. And he notes that at one point in time, we had about 70 million indigenous people here in the US and that declined to about 30, um, and, or sorry, about 3.5 million people. And so we've seen this gigantic population, which again, had pyramids, had architecture, had art, culture, science, math, um, indigenous peoples um, were noted, at, or I'm sorry, indigenous peoples of America were noted as creating the concept of zero um, and actually had the first metric system uh, far before any other um, Western society. Um, they had, uh, you know, a formalized calendar. You've seen that big sundial, right, which uh, was the Aztec and Mayan calendar. Um, so all of these systems were already in place prior to conquest and much of that was destroyed due to um, colonization. Um, the Spanish colonial and encomienda casa and race eras uh, ushered in a new sense of um, uh, political and or social organizational systems here in the country. So um, the Spanish colonial rule gave rise to two important race systems throughout Latin America. First is the encomienda system. And this is important to know because it is very similar to a chateau slavery system. Although um, the encomienda system was largely indigenous centered and they did have a form of chateau slavery. Um, it was a bit distinct than what we saw in the United States. Uh, but essentially the encomienda system was a grant by the Spanish crown to um, uh, settle the land uh, or, you know, what would be Mesoamerica, Christianize all of the indigenous people and create a labor system where uh, the existing, uh, or I'm sorry, a labor system where uh, Spanish settlers would be the kind of overseers of indigenous labor. And so the Spaniards essentially said that they would protect, protect the Indians uh, in exchange for work uh, and you know, save them or civilize them by way of Christianizing them. Uh, where this became very comp, or so what, what the promise was, was never the reality. And so essentially Spanish settlers forced long labored and didn't pay their indigenous workers, basically enslaved them, right? And, and stole their land. And then indigenous people uh, died because of the harsh living and working conditions. And obviously from disease exposure, um, that was uh, brought to them by the Spanish Empire. And so that was very important that the encomienda system, although essentially was supposed to be much more of a kind of civilized serfdom between the Spanish Empire and indigenous people, it actually turned into this large race-based system that uh, fundamentally denied the humanity of indigenous people, um, enslaved them and exposed them to not only horrific working conditions, but disease that um, you know, essentially led to their uh, outright genocide. Um, Coupled with the encomienda system was the Spanish casta system, which we did talk a little about within race, but I wanted to go back to this and show you a little bit more detail on this. So um, uh, the casta system was essentially a racial and political um, classification system because they recognized that there was so much um, racial diversity in Latin America. So this is, you know, again, with indigenous folks, 
um, with some Asians that were coming in because of the pulley labor system, which we'll talk about in a second. And then, um, and then with African Americans or Africans that were coming there, um, we had a complex mixing of individuals in this um, society. And so the Spanish crown wanted to essentially um, uh, organize folks by, uh, by race and political power. So depending on who your parents were, who you were mixed with, would um, align you within a particular um, social order, which you can see here on the right um, in this graph by Goldberg and Dupre, where Peninsula Lares, who were folks who were born in Spain, had the most political power, Criolos or Criolis, which were uh, uh, white Europeans or white Spaniards who were born um, in New Spain, but were still largely white, had the next tier of political power. And then uh, mestizos and mulatos who were basically mixed race individuals with either African-Americans or indigenous were the next tier down. And then lastly, Native Americans and people of African descent were at the bottom, right? Uh, and, and you can see here, obviously, this is the most people with the least power, right? And it, it kind of goes up from there. The other reason why this um, system is important to know, which we've been talking a lot about over this semester, is think about this in context with how we've seen the organization of political and citizenship rights for uh, whites in America, right? So if we think about the Peninsulares back in the 15, 16, and 1700s, we're essentially saying that... Um, uh, rich white folks here at the top have the most political power, which are also the fewest amount, right? So they're the most narrow organizational group. Criollos, which would be, you know, poor whites. I, I mean, obviously they, these folks would have some um, status or maybe have some wealth above the, the next tier down, um, have the next level of political power. So it would go property owning land whites, poor whites. Then we have mixed race folks who are in the next tier down. And then lastly, those historically marginalized communities, which are indigenous folks and African American Africans or Afro Latinos in this case, have the least amount of rights, right? And if we see how that uh, articulates today, those structures or that that social organization system, that social hierarchy, has not changed, right? We still see rich whites at the top. Next down is poor whites. Then we see people of color, uh, and then that vacillates depending on the political context and who's there. Uh, again, reinforcing that idea that race operates on a continuum and that the closest folks to blackness have the least political rights, right? Um, so this uh, process of colonization gives rise to mestizo and mestizaje in Latin America. And so mestizo is literally tr uh, a translation for mixture or mixing, mes mestizaje is a um, cognitive or intellectual uh, framework around um, mixed culture or mixed culturation. Um, but again, in definition, it's the large, largest cultural mixing in the world, which took place in Latin America. Um, Spaniards themselves are already a large mix of cultures. Um, so in Spain, um, we had Moors, Catalan, Basque, and Arabs due to the Ottoman Empire, in addition to the, you know, the existing Spaniards. Um, there are actually, you know, several other sub dialects that are spoken in Spain. Um, the uh, Basque or the Basque people and the Catalans have been trying to secede from Spain for a number of years and actually voted on a referendum or the Catalans, uh, the Catalonians voted recently to actually secede from Spain. Uh, likewise, about eight to 10 percent of the Spanish dialect or Spanish dictionary is Arabic or has Arabic roots. And so there's a lot of overlap from there. And so for folks who speak Spanish and have ever been in a um, Arabic market, they may hear a lot of root words or roots to their words that sound very similar. And that's largely because there was a lot of cultural exchange and the Ottoman Empire actually colonized Spain at one point. Um, Spanish colonization in the Americas also brought, existing, uh, brought its existing cultures and new ones from various regions. Um, so again, African slaves were coming there. Um, they were bringing their own culture and dialect. Um, and then we also had Asian coolie labors, which we'll talk about when we get into our Asian American unit, but that was also increasing that diversification there. So you have to recognize that in Latin America, right, uh, you have not only 
um, Spaniards who were a multitude of different cultures and spoke a multitude of different languages and had a multitude of different uh, belief structures were here. They're encountering a diversity of indigenous communities, right, that are already in existence that have their own particular life ways, languages spoken, so on and so forth, right? Then we're bringing Africans in, right, as a part of the slavery system, um, which is also redefining that, and then also Asian coolie laborers, right? So you, Hispanic American colonies thus, again, were that largest mixing of races and ethnicities in the new world, um, constituting a variety of folks um, from all over the world, right? And, and that's keen in noting, um, one, because, where um, I think the U.S. Uh, did not have the ethnic and cultural diversity until much later, that was already there in existence in Latin America. And what we'll see next in the Latin American um, push for independence is that the folks that were leading that charge were actually stemming from that diversity. Okay. So Latin American independence um, starts to happen through the 19th century uh, and various Latin American Caribbean um, communities are starting to liberate themselves, namely from Spain, Portugal, and France, right? And they overwhelmingly control most of the region at this point. Um, uh, Guinea and Haiti are controlled by France at the time. Spain controls a huge swath of uh, Mexico, parts of the Western United States, and parts of Western, uh, Western South America, and then Portugal controlled huge swaths of Eastern South America, and Brazil, um, which is the largest country in Latin America, uh, you know, is fundamentally Portuguese and, and still has a lot of cultural roots with Portugal. Many of these uh, liberation movements sought to develop a unified Latin America through this sense of um, solidarity pushed by Simone Boulevard, who I'll give you a little bit more background on in a minute with this, this short video clip. Um, and it was much more inclusive of people of color and women, okay? So throughout Latin America, um, and still to this day, a lot of uh, revolutionary organizations and revolutionary fronts um, include um, indigenous people, people of color and women. Um, they're integral to that. Um, when um, much of this uh, revolution was happening across Latin America, um, poor, uh, poor or peasants of color and um, criollos who are these, um, these Spani Spaniards who were born in Latin America um, decided to um, unite against um, the Spanish empire, against the peninsulares, sort of the, the elites essentially and overthrow them. And that type of cross-racial and cross-racial, cross-class and cross-gender solidarity defines all of Latin American liberation fronts, which was unique from the United States, which although um, did allow Africans, African and African-Americans to fight in the Revolutionary War, they did not necessarily guarantee their, their full inclusion and citizenship after the revolution. Um, this was different in um, the, in Latin America, uh, and same thing with women, right? So there was a distinct difference between the two and the sense of, uh, so Simone Bolivar gives way to this idea of Bolivarianism, which actually still guides a lot of revolutionary fronts today. It was a, a crux for um, the Cuban revolution, um, for one time the Puerto Rican secession movement in 1960, um, and a lot of socialistic reforms or socialism reforms throughout Latin America trying to um, push for governmental reform to, de to de-link Latin America from either their, um, Europe or the United States and um, provide uh, land and um, economic reforms that benefited, uh, uh, benefited poor um, Latin Americans at the time. Um, we'll learn a lot about this more in um, Harvest of Empire, but I wanted to show this short video clip that'll give a bit more history on this. This is a map of what the Americas looked like at around the year 1750. And as you can see, it was for the most part divided as colonies by a bunch of European powers. Most prominent is Spain. You can see in this peach brownish color, it had control all the way as south as modern day Chile and Argentina, 
and all the way as far north as modern day Texas and California. You also see significant control by the Portuguese in what will eventually be Brazil. The French have at this point some territory, especially in North America and in several islands in the Caribbean. And the British, of course, have control along the east coast of North America. And they also have several islands in the Caribbean and the Atlantic. As we fast forward 100 years, we're going to see a dramatic change. Notice, roughly 100 years later, most of what used to be these European colonies have now achieved independence. In other videos, we go in some depth from 1776 to 1783, you have the American War for Independence. You see on this map now, the United States is an independent country. From 1791 to 1804, you have Toussaint Louverture lead the revolt against French control, eventually gaining independence and establishing Haiti. From 1807 to 1830, you have a series of revolutions in Latin America many of which were led by Simon Bolivar, who was a criollo or creole, Venezuelan. The term creole has many meanings in modern day language, but in this context, it refers to someone of mostly Spanish descent who was born in the new world. And Simon Bolivar plays an active role in achieving independence from Spain for Venezuela, what will eventually be Colombia and Panama, Ecuador, Peru, and the country that will eventually be named for him, Bolivia. So there is an interesting question here. What led to all of these revolutions? The map that I showed you before, that colonial map of the Americas, these colonies had been in place for several hundred years before these revolutions. Why did all of these revolutions happen roughly at the same time? Well, one overarching idea is that as we enter into the 1700s, you have the intellectual movement known as the Enlightenment. There were many authors and many publications involved in the Enlightenment, but perhaps most famous is the Encyclopédie in French or Encyclopedia, which had the intent of collecting much of the scientific and political science knowledge of the time. And it's considered one of the central texts of the Enlightenment, and it was a series of articles published from the 1750s all the way until the 1770s. And to get a sense of it, here is an excerpt of an article by one of the authors, Denis Diderot, considered one of the primary actors in the Enlightenment. No man has received from nature the right to command others. Liberty is a gift from heaven, and each individual of the same species has the right to enjoy it as soon as he enjoys the use of reason. And so when we get into the Declaration of Independence written by Thomas Jefferson, he borrows heavily from these ideas of the Enlightenment. Now, the Haitian Revolution was partially inspired by these ideas of the Enlightenment, but they were also helped by the fact that France was undergoing its own revolution at the time, and it was not in the position to exert strong control over a far-flung colony. The French Revolution lasts from 1789 to 1799, at which point Napoleon Bonaparte takes control of France and starts the Napoleonic Wars. Napoleon tries to keep control, what would eventually be Haiti, was an incredibly valuable resource. It produced a good chunk of coffee and sugar in the world. It was incredibly profitable for the plantation owners and for France as a nation. But between the ideas of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution, the slaves of Haiti, led initially by Toussaint Louverture, were able to overthrow and set up their own nation, which is the first time that this has happened from a successful slave revolt. This is a map of the empire that Napoleon establishes at its peak. And as you can see, you see France, but he's able to take over much of modern day Germany, Italy, he goes to war with Portugal and then eventually Spain as well, both significant colonial powers in South America. So it's in this context, you have the enlightenment as we get into the 1700s. You already have the example of the American War for Independence, 13 colonies being able to declare independence from one of the largest powers at the time. 
then a successful slave revolt to establish their own country against another significant power. And once Spain and Portugal are fighting Napoleon, coupled with the ideas of the Enlightenment and the examples of the United States and Haiti, it inspires a whole other series of revolts in Latin America, many of which were led by Simon Bolivar. And so by the time we get to 1850, much of the European imperialism in the Americas has come to an end. And so what this ushers in is a new period in Latin America where uh, tons and tons of ships are happening, right? So new countries begin to form throughout uh, the region. Uh, Mexico gets established, which again takes over much of the Western United States. In addition to that, uh, we start to see um, Central America form. Um, there is uh, Cuba, there is Puerto Rico, which are starting to um, gain their own senses of independence. Uh, and then obviously the formation of these different countries in um, South America. Um, the, as this is starting to um, uh, kind of congeal or form, um, there are different uh, issues happening throughout the region, which are causing a lot of social instability. So Spain was trying to regain control over the region uh, and never gave up its own interests in trying to uh, retain its, its former colonies. And then after the Napoleonic Wars, um, France also tries to do so. And French, fr France actually controls uh, Mexico uh, to a certain extent. Um, you may remember this from Cinco de Mayo, but the battle for Puebla is against the French colonial forces in that um, town. And the defeat of the French by uh, the Mexican army um, is lauded as one of the first movements towards independence, although Mexico's independence is actually in uh, is September 16th. Um, the U.S. is also trying to capture and control parts of Mexico and New Spain. Um, frankly, that, you know, it's trying to move uh, west um, to expand slavery and economic development through Manifest Destiny. Um, industrialization and modernization are also happening, which um, this becomes complicated because much of these areas were confined to and centered on um, agriculture. So um, guano or uh, the harvesting of certain fertilizers was big throughout most of South America. Uh, and the shift away from large base agriculture and the shift away obviously from slavery, which was also happening at the time um, because of abolitionism and so on and so forth, changed the fundamental economic conditions. Um, industrialization was happening unevenly uh, throughout most of the region, which was also changing the economic tides as well. This period of Latin America marked both the actualization of independence and self-determination as well as social strife. And this is where I'm gonna introduce this concept of self-determination or this belief in the right of people to freely, free, no, freely determine their political, social, and economic interests. And whether we look at Toussaint Louverture or Simone Bolivar or other revolutionary icons of the time in this region, uh, following the enlightenment uh, philosophies, following the sense of social solidarity across um, Latin America and this desire to be free of the Spanish empire, this sense of self-determination and independence emerges and it is in response to um, this overwhelming uh, colonialism that has been happening in the Western hemisphere for you know roughly about 200 or so years. Shortly after this um, and towards the end of the 19th century, uh, the U.S. gets heavily involved in Latin America with two um, key wars. The first one is the U.S.-Mexico War. Um, this was a, a war with Mexico to expand into the Southwest. President Polk, or James K. Polk, invades and annexes uh, the newly succeeded um, uh, Texas territory. Texas had broken away from Mexico and was seeking independence, and its initial desire was to actually be an autonomous country, um, but President Polk uh, had other motives essentially and uh, basically wanted to capture it. And so his annexation of the region at the time provokes an all out war with Mexico 
the issue was that um, Mexico's uh, population was much more centralized in the south. If you if you know territorially, Mexico City is is further south, and the northern territories are are much more sparsely um, inhabited, and so it was much harder for uh, Mexico to move north to engage in this war with the US, which had uh, you know, formidable forces uh, and they were ramping up and escalating uh, for the civil war, right, uh, at the time. Uh, likewise, you know, uh, the United States had a huge amount of resources and wealth, largely because of the Chateau slavery system that had you know, flourished uh, in that antebellum period. The primary purposes of this war, and, and it, although it's talked about in very nascent terms, I want to be very clear, was to expand slavery and Western expansion, which were basically the same thing. Um, the U.S. had, you know, adopted this idea of um, of manifest destiny that it was their, you know, uh, rights by God to to capture most of the West, right, to to civilize and Christianize the land and and take all of its resources and um, you know did so with a lot of ferocity it's very important to note that the u.s mexico war actually enables a lot of wealth building in the united states not only for the purposes of slavery but we have to also think about what were some of the natural resources in those regions namely that there were huge swaths of gold and oil um, in texas and in california which allowed again for the you know uh burgeoning of the u.s economic force which allowed it to engage in other military skirmishes for land and resources. Uh, shortly after the US-Mexico War is the Spanish-American War. This is a war with Spain over the Caribbean and the Philippine territories. Um, President McKinley Lee backs the island revolutions for independence uh, against or, or in their, the island revolution independence movements from Spain. Um, this is a little bit complicated because while the U.S. recognized and wanted to allow for these independent movements, it did so with a kind of two-faced kind of framework. Um, the U.S. primarily wants to influence or expand its influence into the Atlantic and Pacific regions, and in doing so, or it, uh, coupled with these desires, it actually retains um, the Philippines and Puerto Rico as a colony. Um, Puerto Rico is still a commonwealth of the U.S. Commonwealth is a very fancy term for colony. It's, it's not uh, the same kind of framework. The Philippines um, are considered to be a commonwealth for a number of years. And then due to heavy immigration um, from the Philippines uh, in the early 20th century, there's a um, debate and eventually decision by Congress to uh, withdraw formal control, although we still have a lot of influence in the Philippines. Um, have numerous military bases and use the Philippines as a staging ground for a war with Asia, or ha have been doing so for a number of years. Um, and because of this, Puerto Rico and the Philippines become these awkward colonial subjects where they don't have a lot of rights uh, and uh, are essentially expected to live, you know, under this kind of Americanistic lifestyle. English become very common languages there. Um, uh, Puerto Rico, although overwhelmingly Spanish um, in, its, in its initial colonization, um, has all of its schools converted to English, um, Tagalog, uh, which was the indigenous language of um, uh, the Philippines was already destroyed because of Spanish colonialism in there. Many of the uh, Filipinos um, you know, retain Spanish surnames as part of their last names. Many of them uh, are forced to speak Spanish and then eventually English because of US colonization. And both, um, the Philippines and Puerto Rico are heavily dependent on U.S. economic uh, um, resources. Uh, Cuba was similar to this, um, as with the Dominican Republic, which we'll learn a little bit more about in Harvest of Empire. But it wasn't until um, Fidel Castro and the, and the Castro slash Cuban Revolution that we saw uh, one particular territory try to break away from U.S. control. Uh, and um, U.S or I'm sorry, uh, Latin American countries since um, the Spanish-American wars have been struggling for their own sense of self-determination away from, um, I'm sorry, from the US and from you know, European powers for a number of years you know, since this point. Um, so after this, we give rise to 
um, the U.S. Southwest and this emergent idea of Mexican American. So the U.S. and Mexico established a treaty at Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1865. Um, I'm sorry, in 1856. Uh, and this is to, you know, basically establish peace between the two uh, countries. Um, it also provides new rights for Mexicans uh, or Mexican Americans. And there are important parameters that I want to note here. One, Article 8, um, which uh, allowed for two different uh, caveats uh, the ability for people to uh, retain their property um, in the region if they were Mexican citizens. Uh, so uh, you could stay in your property after the war. Um, you could also do what was called absentee land ownership. If you wanted to leave to Mexico uh, or leave back to Mexico, you could reside in Mexico and still retain your land in the U.S. Or you could sell your property outright and get you know the full amount for that, right? Um, Article 8 also allows uh, Mexican citizens uh, to remain citizens with protections or become citizens. So they're either allowed to uh, become Mexican citizens and uh, still have some uh, legal protected status, meaning they wouldn't be deported, harassed, or mistreated, or um, they would be allowed to become citizens. Okay? Uh, and then lastly, Article 10, which was eventually deleted, ensured Mexican and Mexican Americans would have guaranteed land rights and claims in Texas and other areas of the Southwest. However, this was deleted um, because the US government did not want to ensure that. Um, uh, Mexicans could uh, retain their land, um, specifically because uh, Manifest Destiny was uh, uh, kind of the guiding framework for this westward expansion, and they didn't. Uh, the U.S. government did not want to allow uh, Mexicans to retain that land because they wanted to be able to provide that for you know settlers that were moving west. So this short video will give a little bit more detail on this. In this unit, let's discuss the Treaty of the Lupi Valley. The treaty had two main objectives. The first objective was to bring to end the U.S.-Mexico War. And the second objective was to establish civic and property rights for the people of Mexican descent, now part of the United States. Now, you might think this is uh, an easy thing to do, but it's, it's not. Consider the following, for example. It is not easy to end a war. You would think it is, but it is not like, easy to end a war. And more typical is how do you establish civic and property rights for former Mexican nationals? Consider this. You have people who are in the same house, the same street, the same town uh, where they were born. In fact, where their parents were born, their grandparents were born. And now, without moving anywhere, they are part of a different nation. So what is their future? What will they uh, be seen as? by now the news in the new social order that, that's the question are they mexicans are they americans would they be seen as possible slaves that's the important question when it comes to the civic and the property rights of people of mexican descent that was been negotiated and agreed upon eventually in the treaty of Lupe Valley. let's discuss the units more clearly Let's look at the most important articles that pertain to the Mexican American experience of the Treaty of Guadalupe Articles 1, 5, 8, 9, and 10. So, as we can see, Article 1 is very simple. It's about establishing peace between the United States and Mexico. You might be surprised how many more times after this treaty was signed. Both nations were at the brink of war. As you can see, Article 5 is quite large. Let's try to summarize it into a few uh, sentences. Uh, Article 5, primarily, what it does, it establishes a new boundary between the United States and Mexico in 1848. When you cross the US Mexico border currently, the current border, you might find a plank that says 1853 because of the Gadsden Treaty a few years later. But most of the border that we have now between the United States and Mexico was established by Article 5 of the Treaty of Lupe Valley. So Article 5, again, establishes a new border 
and in doing so, will surrender over half of the Mexican territory to the United States, including the territories of the king states such as California, Arizona, Nevada, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, a bit of Wyoming, of course, and then there's Texas. Most historians will conclude the most important articles that protect the civic and property rights were Articles 8 and 9. This is called Article 8 now. As you have seen, it has two main sections to it. The first section deals with property. What will happen to your property? The first thing you can do is stay where you now reside. Consider the fact that you have been in the same house your family has for generations. So the first thing you can do is stay where you currently reside. The second option is to leave the country, go back to maybe Mexico uh, during the war or during the post-war period, uh, but protecting your property ownership. This is called, this is called uh, absentee land ownership, and it's very, very important. It allows you to go somewhere else and seek refuge while maintaining the ownership of your property in the United States. And the third option you have is to sell the land, sell your property, and remove yourself to Mexico. The second part of Article 8 is very, very important because it deals with civic rights. The question is this, what happens to the status of the the civic status of the former Mexican nationals? These were people who were Mexicans in Mexican territory and without moving anywhere else are now in a different country in the United States. So what is gonna be their status? In Article 8, Section 2, we're looking at the promise of the American government that these folks have a choice. One, they can remain Mexican citizens, but be US residents, kind of like green card holders in a sense, or they can become US citizens, they have a choice. And they are given a year to make the decision, otherwise it was assumed that they want to become US citizens. The article eight is very promising. There will be, as you have read in these chapters in our literature, a lot of problems with this article, section two. For example, most of the people who live in the American territories of the Southwest before Mexico's Northwestern territories were Native Americans, who the Mexican government saw as citizens of the Mexican Republic, but the United States would not see them as possible US citizens. Article 9 is very interesting as well. The main objective of the article is to try to establish the proper time of inclusion. And we see that when we now have a bit more clearance uh, when it says that it will be judged by Congress. So again, main idea is when will the choice given in Article 8 be executed? Article 9 says at the proper time to be judged by Congress. That in itself will lead to other problems. We'll see as we go forward. As you can see, Article 10 was deleted by the United States, much to the anger of the Mexican government. The main reason for that was that Article 10 protected the property rights and land rights of Mexicanos in Texas. This is something the United States could not simply accept. We hope you have enjoyed the articles of the Treaty of Alabidal. And while this is very brief, what I want to stress with this video by um, Dr. Jacobo is that um, there were a lot of provisions in place for these um, individuals uh, in the new you know, US or the, the secession of, of Mexico to, or Mexican territories to the US. However, a lot of this was not necessarily actualized. And, and what we really see is a retrenchment uh, from um, rights or, or this kind of, uh, this absence of rights for Mexican citizens shortly after this period. So Mexican Americans now become a new class of people. They were essentially not white citizens and were also no longer Mexicans. Uh, this created a condition within uh, frontier violence, which, uh, or the frontier, which defines much of the relationship between white settlers and Mexican Americans. As Americans expand west, the land is mostly lawless, where both law enforcement uh, allowed for the extra legal, uh, where um, where law enforcement allowed for the extra legal killing of Mexican bandits. Right, uh, 
Uh, and I provided some photos here of um, Texas Rangers and other lawmen uh, uh, lynching uh, Mexican Americans or Mexican quote unquote bandits. And I asked the question here, what does this killing slash lynching of criminalized men of color remind us of, right? And we have to think back to that convict leasing system and even today with our systems of mass incarceration where the, um, the carte blanche or the killing, of or killing with impunity of, of individuals uh, or in particularly men of color um, because of their you know, uh, subordinated social status or their racialized social status has um, allowed for this. And, and actually what's very notable and this, you'll see in this top picture here that I provided uh, as a part of Mexican, or sorry, not Mexican, as a part of California lore, one of the first lynchings to happen in California was of a woman, a Latina woman, her name um, was Josefa. And um, there's a great book about this called um, Unspeakable Violence, where um, this woman uh, who is, whose last name isn't given, uh, and there, there's a lot of infamy around her, her case. Um, she was at one considered to be a prostitute and, and another hand considered to be a worker. Um, she's uh, accosted by a white miner uh, in this area of California. Um, this leads to a, a small um, physical altercation and um, the white uh, miner basically complains to law enforcement that this person had assaulted her and it allows um, for her lynching or it enables her lynching. And um, much of what was going on in the West was a type of, you know, kind of shoot first and ask question later, largely because one, the interconnectivity of the um, actual government, you know, the federal government to these land areas was not as um, rich or as meaningful as necessary. And remember that um, in the late 1800s, um, there was a lot of political strife um, which leads to the end of the Freedmen's Bureau, which ends to the legal protections for African-Americans in the South. So as this territory is expanding in the West, there's the same kind of lack of concern for people of color in this area. And as a result, this creates a condition where, um, you know, if you uh, are caught doing something wrong, you essentially could just be killed for that and no real uh, recompense uh, for this or no uh, 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 investigation by federal, federal agencies or federal enforcement. And, and that's where I cite or I showed you that um, statistic very early on about the comparability um, for lynching rates between African-Americans and Mexican-Americans um, because their liminal racial status actually um, creates the conditions to where they can be killed with impunity. And uh, because the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is never fully enforced, um, we see a lot of discrimination and mistreatment happen um, shortly after uh, the US-Mexico War. So um, while this is happening, we're also seeing a big push for uh, Mexican immigration into the United States. So, um, in the turn of the 20th century, we start to see a big bump in Mexican immigration. Um, this is largely because there's going to be another revolution fought in Mexico in 1910. Uh, and we also have World War I that happens shortly after the Spanish-American uh, War. Uh, this creates a ongoing relationship um, where uh, Mexican nationals are encouraged to move north to fill labor demands. And um, although this larger chart shows the kind of general trend and tick up of individuals um, immigrating to the US from 1909 to 2009, or 19, from a 1900 period to 2000, 2009, um, we can see a big blip here, right? Uh, where, uh, you know, there's a big, presence of, of Mexican legal, Mexico's legal permanent residents and Mexican born residents here in the US. Um, and uh, that kind of uh, being around that time frame that I was mentioning. Um, 
This begins again that complex relationship between the U.S. government needing Ch Chicanx and Latin Latinx migrant labor and these individuals having to come north due to social instability. And this is again is what we're talking about. We're talking about push and pull migration, right? So again, push factors are what are the factors in the country that are pushing folks away, right? And so in this case, it is this revolution that's happening, social instability that's going on in Mexico, um, so on and so forth, right? Secondly, we also see uh, uh, this pull happening because as America is starting to engage in this war, we see um, Mexicans um, being asked to come north. And I, I provided this uh, flyer here where we can see you know, uh, this kind of unison between uh, Mexican nationals and, um, you know, Uncle Sam, right? So or this idea of the kind of um, Mexican worker and, 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 you know, the American, right? So uh, Americanos todos luchamos por la victoria. And this idea that, you know, Americans for all, let's all fight for victory, right? And we can see here an example of Mexican farm workers coming north off of trains um, during this 1900s or this early 1900s period. Um, sadly, though, um, despite the uh, need and desire for Mexican nationals here in the United States, uh, we did not see these folks welcomed uh, nor treated with the dignity or equality that was one guaranteed by the Treaty of the Guadalupe Hidalgo, nor, um, you know, under the ethos of kind of um, helping migrants settle in um, the U.S. So, uh, Again, remember that we've seen Mexican Americans lynched at comparable weights in the Southwest as African Americans. And so racial violence was uh, you know, overwhelmingly being targeted at this group because they were the larger demographic in the area compared to African Americans. Um, Chicanx and Latinx mixed race industry ancestry, again, kicked them out of that social and legal whiteness. So they faced um, dis discrimination and segregation um, at comparable rates. Uh, and then with the Great Depression of the 1930s, Mexicans actually became the focus of social and economic woes, and uh, the government acted by establishing the Mexican Repatriation Program. And so uh, rather than understanding that the unfettered system of capitalism, which had allowed for this oligarchical class and the, who you know, bet on the stock market the wrong way and crashed the economy, uh, rather than looking at the system or those players or those actors, uh, the U.S. turned its attention on, on Mexicans and, and attempted to deport them as a means of creating the other and creating the, the person to hate. And so the Mexican Repatriation Program uh, happens from 1929 to 1939, roughly the span of the Great Depression, and about uh, 500,000 to 2 million Mexicans were deported uh, Numbers are difficult to assess out because obviously record keeping at the time was very, um, you know, wasn't as good as it needed to be. And actually, two thirds of those folks were actually U.S. citizens. And I and I put um, uh, uh, Mexicans in quotations here, largely because one, you know, many of those folks who were deported were um, U.S. citizens, and also because the U.S. does not have what we would consider good race literacy or a good race lens. And what I mean by that is anybody who looks brown or has a Hispanic surname, oftentimes by the common person in the United States is just considered to be Mexican because Mexicans have by and large been one of the largest demographic groups or uh, Latinx uh, demographic groups here in the US. However, we know that there are a variety of folks here from a, a variety of uh, uh, different Latino countries or Latin American countries and so uh, oftentimes in these big sweeps to deport people, uh, many other folks who are become swept up in that uh, inappropriately. And that's happened even today where we've had a uh, uh, US born, you know, or American citizens who are Latino be caught up in um, immigration raids and in turn in um, ICE detention centers, right? And what I provided here on the right is some examples of segregation, either flyering and or newspapering that shows the kind of racism that was present at the time. Here in California, we had this whites, um, you know, we serve whites only. Um, this park is for white people only, Mexican and Negro stay out. Uh, here in El Paso, Texas, right in 1929, again, at the start of this program, no dogs, Negroes, and Mexicans, another example of segregation. 
and these new pa- newspaper clippings show um, how uh, in Oklahoma and in Los Angeles, there was a big push to deport people uh, back to uh, Mexico, right? And so, uh, again, this is a, a, a part of a larger trend, which will actually set the framework for um, civil rights movements that we'll see in the next couple of years. And so at the same time that we were seeing the convict leasing system happen in the US, which was again, um, enslaving or re-enslaving Africans, we also had a big push to bring in Mexicans um, as cheap labor to, um, uh, you know, to, to support the war effort, to support the, the burgeoning American society. But those folks were also treated as second class citizens like African-Americans were under the Jim Crow and Black Codes uh, system. So with that, uh, we've kind of gone over a lot of material. So we've talked about what is Chicanx and Latinx, what is early Mesoamerican and indigeneity in you know, the, the continental or the Western hemisphere, how Spanish colonial rule shaped race, the emergence of mestizo and mestizaje, this push for Latin American independence and the new Latin America, U.S. involvement in Latin America and the and the U.S. Southwest um, shortly after um, specific wars, and then lastly, Chicanx um, uh, migration and racialization in the early 20th century. And again, those key terms for today are mestizo, self determination, and push pull and migration. With that, I'll leave it there, and I'll see you guys next time.